Thank you for joining us today for a My Varian webinar event. We are delighted to have medical physicist Taryn Lee from the University of Pennsylvania with us to discuss breast treatment on the Halcyon. Before I turn it over to Dr. Lee, I will give you a moment to review the Varian safety slide. As a reminder, all products and features are not available in all markets. Dr. Lee, you are good to take it away. Thank you, Karen. Uh, good morning, or good afternoon, good evening, and whatever time zone you are. Uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, for this uh, webinar hosted by Varian, and thank Varian very much for this opportunity to really share our experience on the breast planning on health young system. Um, uh, here's my, my disclosures. So before I start, I want to really take a moment and acknowledge the whole uh, Halcyon team at Penn who have contributed substantially to a lot of the content that we're going to talk about today, and especially um, our physicists, uh, Chris Kennedy and Ryan Sherman and Douglas, and the symmetrist on TIDA, our physicians, uh, Gary, and our therapist, Curry McBrien, and of course the leadership, Dr. Laydon and Dr. Jim Metz for um, very, very generous support for this uh, project. So we were the first one to treat patients on Halcyon, and there's a picture of the core team at that time who made this happen, so we're very proud of that. So a little bit of background for the Penn Clinic. So we are the one of the largest integrated clinics that has both photon and tri proton treatment modalities. So here you can see in the gray uh, square, we have five proton treatment rooms, and then here we have five Photon treatment rooms, um, and uh, and then they are adjacent to each other, and so that you know we can our patient basically can be treated in the best combination of, of, of both modalities. Um, so, and in this year, uh, earlier this year, uh, an, an unforeseen downtime happened on the proton side, and resulted in extended downtime uh, that uh, we we have to deal with. So at that point, there are about between 80 to 90 patients on treatment on the proton side. And you know, we are an integrated clinic, so we want to transfer all the patients to the photon, which means that uh, our photon treatment volume is going to be uh, almost doubled. So this is, this is a graph showing the amount of patients gets transferred to the true beam, to the health young, and the end of the treatment time for the clinic. So you can see that um, between, here, roughly around here is where that downtime happened. So our patients were transferred, uh, about 10 to 20 patients were transferred to being, majority of the patients actually are transferred to the health young. So our health young treatment volume went from about 60 patients of, almost overnight to about 120 patients. And we only extended the clinic operation hour by one hour. So that just shows how much, how powerful the health young uh, is as a platform to handle um, fast throughput treatment and at the same time can maintain quality. So hopefully by the end of this talk, you can have a good idea of how uh, we and, and together with the Health Young platform achieve that. So here's our learning objective. So we're going to talk about the changes the Health Young um, have made uh, par compared to CRM Linux. So I'm assuming that everybody is familiar with CRM Linux. And we're going to talk about how these in changes impact the treatment planning and the delivery of, uh, in, in particularly to the breast cancer uh, type of uh, uh, scenario, and then we're going to talk about techniques and tools to facilitate this treatment, as well as clinical cases, as an example, how we really, really treat different type of breast cancer on this platform. So here's the brief outline. I'm going to go through uh, each block one by one. So first of all, what's new? So the entire accelerator system is newly is is completely designed from ground up. It is uh, straight through Linux which means that there's no bending magnet. The entire structure is simplified with um, everything mounted on this ring-shaped gantry, which reduced noise because a linear, linear motor was used around the gantry uh, rather than a, a, a motor and drive a belt, and this we commonly would see on the other Linux. It rotates four times faster at the maximum speed. Uh, it, uh, it has only one energy, six FFF, no bending magnets. We, uh, the machine used a magnetron as opposed to cholesterol, and the maximum dose rate is limited at 800 MU per minute. And that is the uh, accelerator part. The collimation is also different. Um, 
the color, the, uh, there's no draw. There's a drawless dual layer MLC system that, re that basically replaces everything beyond the uh, primary color meter. Uh, the field size limitation is 25, 28 by 28. Uh, just, one thing to note is that does not change with color meter rotation because the primary color meter uh, is actually a square primary color meter. So when you rotate the color, secondary color meter, which means in this case the, draw, the MLC system, you're still getting cut off on the top and bottom. So the maximum field size in soup and inferior and left to right direction is capped at 28 by 20, regardless of the column meter rotation. It also has the thickest MLC leaf uh, that Varian put on a commercial uh, linear, linear accelerator products. Uh, the MLC in Halcyon is 10 millimeters thicker than all the other MLCs. Um, that, coupled with the dual layer uh, de design, reduces the transmission beyond MLC system to less than 0.1%. Which is, which is uh, basically even better than the draw system transmission uh, characteristics. Uh, it has a larger rounding radius. It is designed to compensate for the MLC position being higher in a beam line. So uh, that, that way the, the, the transmission per number is kept, the transmission per number is reduced, but the total per number is kept as similar to the CRM Linux. It moves twice as fast compared to uh, two beam MLCs and it travels twice as far from the carriage, so that we're getting 28 centimeters full travel uh, out of the, uh, the carriage. So this is, this is a unique uh, uh, advantage for this MLC system. The IGRT system is also new. So uh, now with the, with the uh, version 1.0 on the Halcyon, we have uh, MV Combeam CT capability. That's the only Combeam CT capability for Halcyon 1.0. Uh, here's just shows you some images for the MV Combeam CT. We treated based on MV Combeam CT and MV, MV imaging technique exclusively from uh, September 2017 to June, uh, end of June 20, end of July 2018. So we can see that the contrast uh, on these images, and you can see it is. Uh, we think it's sufficient to do bone and anatomy, but soft, soft tissue obviously you need a little bit better contrast. And we did uh, publish. A, uh, a characteristic, uh, uh, characterizing a, a sort of an article characterizing the IMV Combeam CT system, um, and that and that system has a fixed trajectory from 230 uh, to 130 degrees, meaning that it rotates in the in the anterior part of the patient if the patient is supine. Uh, for breast treatment, here we look at the the uh, normal tissue, key normal tissue uh, doses, those statistics um, for IMV Combeam CT for eight patients. You can see that roughly we're looking at a heart mean being about between 2.5 to 5 C gray per fraction. So if you use MV Cohn beam CT and tangential beams, you're expecting your heart dose to be elevated, heart mean dose to be elevated by about 2.5 to 5 C gray per fraction. That translates to about 0.5 to 1 gray through the entire treatment system, uh, treatment course, and depends on the fractionation, of course. But that's our, in general our our, um, our observation. Um, so. That, that is the reason why as soon as KV Combeam CT becomes available, we immediately switch all our patients to KV Combeam CT system. The KV Combeam CT uh, on the Halcyon is also new. It has the largest KV imager um, on the, uh, on the uh, photon Linux system that's from Varian, 43 by 43 centimeters imager. It's intentionally offset and permanently offset so that we can acquire a larger field of view through the half fan um, uh, acquisition geometry, um, and, and then uh, the the in plane sort of axial um, field of view is nearly 50 centimeters, and then we're getting 24.5 centimeters superior and inferior, which is larger than the uh, typical uh, two KV Combeam CT on two beam system. It also has a fast acquisition, 16.6 seconds, uh, which means that a Combeam CT can be acquired in a single breath hold, and that is a very helpful. Of the IBH patient that we're going to treat on the uh, Halcyon. Yeah. So it has improved uh, image quality. So this is an example of Halcyon KV Combeam CT under the uh, 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 low dose protocol. You can see that even as low dose protocol, uh, the uh, the ability to see the um, tumor bed and other soft tissue is actually excellent uh, compared to traditionally we're used to do KV planner or MV um, uh, portal images, and this gave our physician a lot more information. Here's a shows you the scanning time for KV Combeam CT protocols. Again, there are a combination 
there are a total of 19 protocols um, on the health system divided by treatment sites and, and if we, you know, if you user they like to use iterative combined CT or non iterative combined CT, so you can see that uh, for breast and thoracic applications, they all have a, a protocol that complete the scan in 16.6 seconds. In addition to, in addition to the uh, IGRT system being different, the um, gantry system obviously is exchanging from a C arm to a ring, which means that the ring. The ring gantry, uh, the patient is actually inside the ring gantry uh, or the bore when we treat when we get when the patient is getting treated. So, uh, to facilitate the collision detection, um, the uh, ring gantry geometry is actually uh, provided in the treatment planning system, so the user can actually see uh, and assess the distance between different patient support structures and the patient body relative to the uh, the uh, bore um, location, um, and um, the couch itself is a three degree, degree of freedom couch, which means that we can only do translational correction for all of the for all the patients that treated on Halcyon. Um, this brings uh, about 10 to 20 percent re-imaging uh, frequency for the patient treated at 10, um, due to that the couch cannot be rotated to correct any rotation or any um, rotation errors. Um, on the patient. So uh, what it's interesting to see is that the uh, correction frequency goes up and then down and up. And then it happened to be that this two uh, sort of higher correctional frequency area happened to when we shift the, the group of therapists, a new group of therapists to the system. So with the proper training, we expect the, uh, the correction frequency or re-imaging frequency to be less, about around 10% or less. The Halcyon also comes with pre-configured beam data, meaning that as a physicist, uh, you can verify the data, but you won't be able to change the data in your treatment planning system. So uh, no change of DLGs and no change of uh, transmission, and all of them are fixed, um, which means that two things. One is very fast deployment. Um, the, the amount of time from the Halcyon system was delivered, which is just in three boxes, and then to the time that the system can be clinically released, it typically estimated to be two weeks, and that's exactly what we had in our two system installation. Another reason, another good thing about this is all Halcyons are matched. So when your patient transfers from one Halcyon relative, whether it's within your building or, or to another Halcyon in your facility, um, you don't even have to do a dose, uh, mission override. Everything is stays the same. The planning workflow is also simplified, and this is not the this is not a big change, but you know it's worth mentioning. The imaging protocol, KV combined CT, MV combined CT, and MV MV pairs has to be decided at the time of planning. So you cannot add ad hoc imaging on the treatment uh, on the treatment console. So everything is predetermined. Um, and that and another another uh, change is that plan scheduling is automatically done at the time of treatment uh, plan approval. So when physician appro plan approves the plan, uh, all this scheduling are done and all the images are automatically scheduled. And you can see that all the integrated imaging for each of the beam is actually also automatically scheduled, which generates a lot of uh, data, uh, potential research opportunities if you want to look into the integrated imaging or transit image uh, to um, perform certain tasks. So that covers of the rough, uh, rough overview of what have changed um, Halcyon system compared to your CR MINAC. Accelerator simplified, collimation jawless, uh, 28 by 28 centimeter limitation, uh, IGR systems all newly designed, faster combined CT, high quality, uh, larger uh, field of view. Um, treatment delivery, it can be visualized, uh, clearance can be visualized in the treatment uh, planning system and the beam data is pre-configured. So the next step, we're going to look at how these impact the, the actual treatment or the sort of how we administer treatment in our workflow. So the first thing is, of course, is efficiency. As we, as we mentioned uh, at the beginning of the talk, that we're able to absorb a large amount of patients on this machine without you know, extending the treatment time by a lot. Uh, we have been using uh, healthy on, on all the treatment sites, and across the treatment sites, we're seeing between three to five minutes reduction um, total in-room time or uh, a total appointment active time um, compared to the uh, two-beam system. 
uh, we also observed the reduction in the in the clinic hours when the second Halcyon system was installed. We reduced, uh, so now we have three true beam systems and two Halcyon systems, and the two Halcyon are treating, uh, taking about 50% of our patient load, and the other uh, three true beams are reserved for more complex cases, SBRT, TSET, uh, total body, uh, uh, special procedures like that. So another thing that we, we evaluate is the plant quality. So because the MLCs are wider um, and, and if there's a new layer, everything is a, new, is a new system, new MLC system, we want to see how, how that system translates into the plant quality. Um, we actually were observed a reduction in the uh, uh, OAR mean dose compared to uh, the true beam system uh, for head and neck patients. Uh, when we use IMRT. The reason, the primary reason for that is because of less transmission. So if you think about that, the majority of these OARs or the OAR windows actually determined by the leaf transmission. They belong to the leaf transmission area um, that are shielded most of the time. So if, if we reduce the transmission from 1.5, which is a typical M value for, for two beam, to 0.1%, um, percent, then we see a, a substantial reduction and that number goes, of course, you, the more MU you have, you know, the more reduction there is for the IMRT. For VMAT, this is because of the ML, um, MU being lower, we did not observe a much difference. For small target, we also stress test the system. So we, you know, did, we put uh, multi ISO center SRS patients that were previously treated on HDMLC and they run plans on the Halcyon to see really how, how uh, conformal, how this MLC system performs under this very small target circumstances. Uh, we were able to see that for co-planner settings, um, any targets above 1.5 cm, we do not see difference uh, in both uh, conformity and gradient for that target. And we, we tested, we compared to co-planner uh, situation because there's Halcyon can only treat coplanar beams, obviously. So uh, if it's just testing the MLC, MLC system's uh, performance in terms of conformity and gradient, this is a fair comparison. So for us, any targets above 1.5 cm, we're comfortable sending that patient to Halcyon in terms of plant quality um, uh, concerns. Also, we, uh, because the system has a single 6 FFF energy, that brings, that, that brings us a lot of questions when we treat large separation patients. As we know, 6-FFF or 6 uh, flat and filter free energy has much less penetration power uh, than typically uh, Linux equipped with 15x or sometimes even 18x. So we, this is just to show the graph of the maximum dose that uh, we're expecting for a 10 by 10 opposed field uh, it, when we uh, deliver this opposed field on the uh, different the pa patient with different thickness. So you can see that between 20 to 25, we're already getting about 110, 15 to 120 a hotspot uh, within that opposed field. And you look at the distribution at Penn, about 20, 20 uh, about 75 percent of the patients belong to the range le uh, with the separation less than 25 centimeters. So internally, our guidelines, as long as the, if the patient water equivalent distance is above 25 cm, we would avoid using directly opposed field when, 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 we, when we treat the patient on healthier. Alternative will be we add more lateral fields to sort of bring the dose uh, hot spots uh, to the side or average the hot spot. And also, uh, it, when, that, when, when we can, we can use BMAT to mitigate that uh, situation. Another uh, challenging part for, for planning initially is the non flat beam plan, uh, profile. The beam on Halcyon, of course, it, without planning filter, it, it tapers down as it go from the center axis to the side. Um, to, and this becomes a, a, a challenging for uh, simple 3D plans, field and field technique, because the symmetries are not trained to sort of adjust the field while taking into consideration of the, um, uh, the beam profile. In fact, I don't think any human can, can actually do that, but taking this two consideration into, uh, you know, more just two, uh, uh, sort of aspects together in, in the brain and do the calculation. So uh, there are several ways to deal with this. Uh, Farron provided a flattening sequence or the dynamic, dynamic beam flattening uh, uh, function that uses the top layer of the MLC to flatten the beam. And then in the bottom layer of the MLC, shape the beam. So this way, uh, this is transparent to the user. So the user can just use it as if it is a 
um, uh, flattened beam, but at the same time, uh, you are actually getting a flat beam, and, and, and your dosimetry team does really need uh, extra training for that. Alternatively, you can use electron electronic compensation. Electron your electronic compensation, or ECOMP, is designed to compensate this uh, irregular surface and also the inhomogeneity within the patient body at once so that we deliver a uniform dose within a volume. So that's the, that's the, the, the concept of ECOMP. A lot of, a lot of places already use ECOMP for breast planning. Uh, the downside of using this too is that at least at, in our institution, we're running total symmetry patients with the QA for all of these patients. Uh, another uh, challenge we had to deal with when we start implementing the system is that um, because of the field limitation is 25, 28 centimeters uh, superior and inferiorly, for targets longer than 28, for example, we routinely see advanced stage GYN patients with 30, 35 centimeter um, superior and inferior target size. Uh, how do we do that? So for those cases, we would have to use two isocenters. So fortunately, uh, Eclipse version 15, uh, I think 15.5 above, uh, provide this function called automatic feathering. So the dose contribution from these two isocenters are automatically feathered so that uh, any patient movement between the two isocenters actually uh, won't be a, 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 a important concern in terms of how the, do how the cold spots when the two, I mean, when the dose are added from these two sets of arcs. On the Halcyon system, the, the delivery can be automated between the two isocenters if their isocenters are less than eight centimeters, centimeters apart. You can do one set of imaging and move to one isocenter, deliver, and move to the other isocenter and deliver. So um, another concern that we had for the for treating breast patients on Halcyon is that lack of electron beams. So that means that all of the boost boost treatment for that particular patient, if we want to treat the patient on Halcyon, will have to be photon boost. Overall, we were able to treat 75% of our breast patients who had their initial treatment on Halcyon. Um, uh, remains on health and to receive their, uh, their uh, boost treatment. And then 20% of them would have to use the electron on a true beam uh, and, 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 and some other modalities. So that's, uh, that's the summary of the overall impact. Again, higher efficiency because everything moves faster, plant quality stays the same, uh, any, any, any targets larger than 1.5 cm, we don't have a concern for that. For simple 2D, you would have to use dynamic beam flattening or ECOM to take care of the beam profile being non-flat. For long targets, we use two isocenters uh, that take, take advantage of the automatic delivery uh, that Halcyon provides, and actually that's a, a very time-saving uh, uh, feature. And then in terms of electron and boost treatment, we'll have used photon boost. So let's move on to more specifically uh, how we treat breast cancer on Halcyon. So the first one, obviously, is patient selection. Because of the limitation of the uh, water equivalent distance being less than 25, otherwise uh, the hot spot is no longer acceptable, we have to measure each patient either distance, to start with the distance, or the water equivalent distance um, before, when the patient gets simulated. Our internal practice is that we're going to put the patient on Halcyon, schedule the patient on Halcyon by default, and then when the patient comes for simulation, we will do, do the measurement and decide if we can treat the patient on the health end or not. For this particular patient, you can see that distance, the central axis distance between uh, this, the, this, side, uh, this side and this side of the body is about 18.25 cm. Um, because they're long, the, the water equivalent distance is actually lower than that, so we should not be having any problem treating this particular patient on health end. For uh, simulation, for breast treatment only, who in the supine position, we use Q-fix angle board with arm shuttle, both arm extended. We use head neutral, um, and uh, uh, we use DIBH when, when we're treating left side or, or if we deem uh, beneficial to the patient. For breast plus comprehensive nodal irradiation, uh, the only, we do the same setup, same immobilization device, Q-fix angle board with arm shuttle. The only difference is that we use VECLOC for the arm positioning. So we will put the patient's arm in the backlog back so that every day the positioning of the arm is uh, accurately, or relatively accurately reproduced, and the head is turned away from the treatment side, so head turned to the contralateral side. Okay, and also we use DIBH if we need. 
the only difference, the different step um, for simulating patients for Halcyon uh, compared to other machines is that we would measure the contralateral elbow or contralateral immobilization device position at the time of simulation. This provides us a reference for collision check. So when we do our planning, we actually reproduce this point in the treatment planning system and look at how far that point is from the board. So that, that gives us a confidence of the patient that will be fitting into the board without any problem. And the good thing about health and systems is as long as the patient is in the board, the, the treatment process should not have any collision concerns. The DIBH, um, the health sound system does not provide, at least at this point, does not provide any active breathing, breath control or respiratory control technique. Uh, capabilities. So there's no gating, there's no RPM system um, integrated in, this, in that uh, platform. So we use a third-party solution called uh, SDX from Dynar, and that is a spirometer-based system that has a visual feedback for the patient. So everything, so the patient will um, breathe in and breathe out a certain amount of air, and that air is measured to determine if the, every day, if the patient is holding the same amount of air. And uh, we had no problem fitting the system into the treatment board, and we are, um, this is the, our uh, choice of administering uh, uh, DIBH patient to breast, uh, DIBH treatment to the breast patient. In terms of field and field planning technique, obviously we talk about uh, we can use dynamic beam flattening and then just, use, just treat it as a purely 3D and use field and field uh, planning. Uh, the, the limitation is that in this case, because again, we're shaping the beam using the bottom layer, we're flattening the beam using the top layer. So the bottom layer has, the MLC has one CM wide leaves, which means that you can only have one CM um, modulation or shaping accuracy in the Y direction. And that's one limitation we have to do, uh, we have to deal with. The alternative to that is that you can rotate some, for some segments, you can rotate the collimator to 90 degrees to sort of mitigate that. Another thing, another downside for using the uh, dynamic beam flattening is the extended delivery time. So because the top, six, top layer has to move, has to be move, moving to flatten the beam, uh, on average we see about either between 20% and 60% increase in the amount of MU um, needed uh, to deliver the same amount of dose to the same depth when we use DBF or versus when we use open field. So in, that translates into longer time because MLC sometimes cannot move fast enough. So when we started to use this technique on a couple of uh, DIBH patients, we noticed that the uh, treatment time is uh, extended to a lot because we use DBF. And, and because of the DIBH, the patient has to be mul doing multiple breath hold and it's, it's to the point that it's no longer acceptable to the patient. So our guideline is that for DIBH patient, we will no longer use DBF, we will switch completed to ECOM technique. Um, and then as soon as we switch to ECOM technique, of course, you can see that the beam on time is, has dropped to less than about three minutes. The total in-room time has dropped from you know, 30 to 40 minutes to about 10 to, 12, 10 to 15 minutes. So uh, let's move on to the what, what we, mo for a majority of cases, we use ECOM. So the ECOM techniques is the one that I'm going to be covering most in this, uh, in this talk. So electron compensation, again, we're going to o o review the, the goal of electron comp electronic compensation. Electronic compensation is to use a dynamic or use a fluence to compensate the skin surface irregularity, the inhomogeneity within the radiated volume so that we get a uniform dose, or as, as uniform as possible, dose distribution within the irradiated volume defined by the aperture. So um, manual electron kind of compensation has been around for a while, and then typically people start with irregular surface compensator to get a rough fluence, and then manually adjust the fluence, pending the fluence, and do the dose calculation, if it, and then go back to adjusting and do those calculations again. And total, that effort totally can take anywhere between one to four hours, and it's very tedious. And also, it requires a lot of skills from, from the planner. So a skilled, skillful planner can do it very fast and, and very nicely, but in the, the learning curve is pretty um, steep for this type of technique. So um, this technique is actually described in detail by uh, Chris Kennedy in the previous uh, webinar, but I'm, I'm just going to put it here just for reference. This is what we had 
in the past and when we did the, uh, the version one treatment, we used this technique. And then there, and, uh, a more automated way to do e-comp uh, is to use the built-in photon optimizer from Eclipse. The, re the way we do this is that we ask physicians to, to set the aperture of the treatment just as if they set, they set, set aperture for other, for the tubing treatment. And then we'll do the first round of rough dose calculation and convert the 50% of those line to the uh, volume. That volume is basically what we define as irradiated volume by that aperture. Then we use this optimizer to deliver uniform dose to this irradiated volume. Again, here we're not treating any, we're not give, particularly shaping dose to any targets or avoiding any OARs. This is purely using the optimizer to deliver a uniform dose within a volume. Exactly the same way, same uh, goal as a field in field planning. And then after that, we will use the skin flash tool to create the skin flash um, out, of, out of the field that generated by the optimizer. You can see for this particular case, because it's a two isocenter case, you can see this decrease in the fluence, compensation, uh, fluence contribution for this particular isocenter when it goes to the overlap region with the superior isocenter. We'll talk about this more um, in the next several slides. Another way, alternative to, to use in the built-in photon optimizer is to use a plugin called Easy Fluence. And uh, that, that plugin is developed by, uh, marketed, and developed and marketed by Red Formation. Um, uh, and uh, it is released as Eclipse uh, script that the user can invoke within Eclipse. So it works directly based on open MLC apertures. Um, and they gen automatically generates fluence to deliver uniform dose, just as the photon optimizer, except for that you're able to see the trade-off in real time within the system um, to see, okay, I want more coverage or reduce the hotspot, and also automatically add skin flashing uh, uh, when we use easy fluence, where in the photon optimizer, you have to run the skin uh, flashing tool. So, the 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 ecomp uh, system is actually a, is a very I mean sorry the the easy fluent system is a very efficient system. It takes roughly for our dosimetry five minutes for a two field breast plan to be generated, and it's a very it doesn't have a lot of training required, and it doesn't depend on the planner's 3D planning skills very much. Uh, um, so which which is not good for training uh, residents and, and, and new dosimetrists, but you know for, for from the uh, production team pro point of view, it's actually a very efficient tool. So DZ Fluence is now the primary tool for 2D 3D planning on Halcyon at Penn. So everybody, all of their patients, if we're decided a patient needs a 3D planning, uh, easy Fluence is the one that we're going to try first. Of course, um, for a lot of the challenging cases, we can use VMAT for uh, breast planning. Um, in those cases, including if the IMN is situated very deep and it needs a full dose coverage, as a lot of the, uh, the, the trial patients we got um, have this type of requirement, or the patient with very large separation, making them impossible um, to, to fit in the, uh, a tangential beam arrangement with 6FF energy. So the advantage of using VMAT on Halcyon is that uh, to treat breast, at least, it's a very straightforward optimization workflow. Uh, you can basically say, I want a full coverage to this irradiated volume, and that's it. It's a very fast delivery, again, due to the gantry rotating being faster. Um, doesn't have any, uh, doesn't have uh, reduced, doesn't have collision concerns, basically. The, the isocenter actually can be pl placed, um, uh, you know, have more freedom to, to place the isocenter in different locations within the body. And then has, uh, it can take the, uh, the advantage of using multiple isocenter delivery, automatic isocenter delivery. So I want to talk about multiple isocenter and why that's that important to the breast uh, planning. So Python 2.0 again supports multiple isocenter treatment. Uh, we can we can for a plan we can have two treatment isocenters and one imaging isocenter. They can all be different in v direction and v direction only. So the automatic delivery will occur if the top treatment isocenter and the bottom treatment isocenter are within eight centimeter apart. And that is essential for breast treatment because a lot of times for breast treatment, we want to use a common isocenter between the supraclavular field and the tangent field so that we made it so that we have a, have a better match at this match line. We don't have to deal with divergence problem. However, for Halcyon, because 
the maximum distance from the isocenter to the inferior edge of the field is only 14 centimeters. That's often not enough to cover the breast tissue. So we have to use a second isocenter inferior to the top isocenter so that the, the bottom edge of the field can cover the entire breast tissue. Just as this graph is showing, we have a top isocenter and we have a bottom isocenter. And normally we'd put it at six to eight centimeters inferior to the top isocenter. Again, this technique essentially is no different from the mono isocenter technique that we commonly use to treat multi, to treat comprehensive nodal irradiation. Uh, the only difference is that we need a second isocenter to cover the tangential part of the breast tissue. So the KV Combin CT isocenter is then selected to be somewhere in between. The idea is that we want to be able to visualize the nodal area as well as the breast area as much as possible uh, with that KV Combin CT. And if you and um, the auto the only thing uh, that's that's uh, important to notice here is that auto feathering auto feathering function uh, as shown here the distance sort of the uh, the contribution the fluence contribution from the top isocenter is gradually decreased as it goes to the bottom isocenter territory and then the bottom isocenter uh, sort of sort of gradually pick up the contribution and then until it has a full contribution toward the end of the inferior part of the breast. So this function is only available through a photon optimizer. So if you plan this type of cases, the easy fluence plug-in doesn't work, irregular surface compensator doesn't work, we have to use the uh, photon optimizer in order to do, in order to take advantage of this automatic delivery and automatic feathering. Okay, so now let's really look run through a couple of examples of how we treat each type of case. So the first one is simple supine breast only treatment. So we'll set up with arm board and with the breast board with both arm up, and then typically we we'll wire the breast and we use SDX device for DIBH. The field arrangement is very typical. We use tangential or opposed beam with isocenter the chest wall. Uh, we default the imaging protocol to KV Combin CT, use the same isocenter as a treatment isocenter, and uh, we, uh, our planning technique is easy fluence, uh, mostly using easy fluence. Alternatively, you can use field and field with dynamic beam flattening. Step is that uh, we, we get the initial aperture contoured by the physician, we calculate the 50% isodose line that defines the irradiated volume. And then we will fit the Halcyon initial aperture to this volume, use easy fluence to generate uniform dose, or to generate a fluence that delivers uniform dose to this irradiated volume, inspect the fluence, make sure it looks correct, and then approve the plan based on the final dose calculation. If it's a prone breast, we do treat a lot of not large number of prone breasts in Halcyon, and we do not, we have uh, not, never really had any problem with the clearance. So we use QFIX uh, prone breast board with both arms extended, back lock back at the arm level again to make sure that arm positions are reproducible, and the, um, we use markers on the back of the patient, three markers on the back of the patient to make sure the patient is straightened before sending to the board. Again, this goes back to the, the fact that the couch cannot do rotation corrections automatically, or uh, basically cannot do rota rota rotation correction period. So we have to use um, the strengthening markers to make sure we, the patient is strengthened. And then we use tangential beams. The one difference we do for this type of treatment is that we place isocenter in the middle of, in the midline of the patient. And that is because we want better clearance um, for this type of patient. If you put it laterally, uh, that's reduced the clearance Side, on this side of the patient to the board, or the, um, more, more importantly, on this side to the couch to the board. We did a study on, on TIDA, one of our students, did a systematic study comparing adosymmetric, in, uh, certain adosymmetric consequence of you know, placing the isocenter in the breast versus midline, we did not see much difference. So our, our um, strategy is to place isocenter midline to the patient, even though we're treating one-sided prone breast. The planning technique, of course, we, uh, not, we select the automatic e comp with user fluence as the primary technique to try. For comprehensive nodal irradiation, meaning that we're treating IMN, um, uh, supraclavular and axillary nodes, as well as the breast itself or the chest wall itself, uh, we use the back lock back to keep the arm position uh, the same throughout, throughout the treatment and head turned away to the contralateral side. And then basically everything is the same except for this multi-isocenter setup. 
So that the, as we discussed for this type of treatment, we use two isocenters, the, the upper isocenter and the lower isocenter. Upper isocenter is a common isocenter shared between the superclocular fields and the tangential field. Lower isocenter is about eight, six to eight centimeters inferior to that. The superclocular fields, we turn the collimator 90 degrees. The reason is that we want to have a very fine adjustment at this match line so that we can sort of really mitigate the cold spot or hot spot that's happening over here. Um, and then we place the PV isocenter somewhere in between so that we can visualize both the nodal region and the, uh, the breast region. And the breast arrangement itself looks like this. So this is sort of I'm showing the medial and anterior beams. This is the superclavular. This is the two um, tangential beams. This shows the beam from the back of the patient. These are the two lateral beams. Again, this is the top beam. This is the bottom beam. And then this is the PAB uh, from, from the back of the patient. And we, we have uh, the, uh, all the field offline displayed on the patient. It forms a very nice match line here between the uh, top two beams um, and the superclavular region. So for the planning technique we employed for this type of treatment, superclavular and PAB would typically use either the manual ECOMP um, or the uh, um, field in field with DBF. The reason is that we want to be able to manually weight this patient to, to roughly pull the dose to this anterior part to, this, to very similarly to what we will, manu will, what we will do for the uh, typical uh, superclavular planning. The only difference is we will take collimator 90 degrees so that we can manually adjust the fluent at this edge of around this area of the match line. Tangential beams, we use automatic econ with photon optimizer. Again, the reason we use photon optimizer for this particular uh, set of treatment is that we want to be able to take advantage of automatic feathering provided within the photon optimizer. And in, for imaging, KVS center is chosen uh, anywhere between to maximize the visibility of nodal and the breast volume. So here shows the steps, the same thing, physician decide the desired aperture, we transfer the aperture using the volume of 50% as of those volume calculated from that aperture, which defines the irradiated volume. Um, PAB and the uh, superclavular fields are, are uh, planned using the uh, field in field or the uh, manual ECOM technique to, co to cover the target. And genital beams are done uh, with the, uh, uh, to deliver the, the uniform dose to the irradiated volume using photon optimizer and then we'll add imaging field uh, at the end. So these are the set of the field example, so field example for one particular patient. So three isocenter groups, imaging isocenter KV Combin City by itself, upper isocenter um, from the treatment fields that houses both the upper tangential field, this one, this one, and the superclavular fields. So this is the common isocenter for superclavular and tangent field. And then the lower part, lower isocenter for treatment beams, which has the two fields, two tangential fields, um, mid low and lateral low. So when it comes to boost, we talk about that for patients uh, that get near boost on healthy and will have to use photon um, boost beams. So we use the same same CT and same setup as the primary. Uh, we use either mean tangents or 3D beams uh, and use easy fluence to perform the um, to deliver the uh, sort of the uniform dose to the targets um, employing the um, e technique. Of course, you can use field and field uh, with the DBF. And sometimes if the target is very small, you can actually don't use the DBF, just directly use the field and field, even though it's a FFF beam, it's small enough that doesn't, so FFF does not affect the, the beam profile that much when the, the, when the field is small. So in terms of daily comb beam CT, we wanted to mention uh, this is actually a very welcoming uh, change to our breast team because now instead of getting, doesn't get any image confirmation for a week and then you get a portal, weekly portal image, we are, our physicians are now getting daily comb beam CT, daily full volumetric verification of the patient being treated correctly. Um, it is a very low dose protocol. As you can see that exposure is only f a 45 um, uh, MAS and the uh, CTDI, the estimated CTDI, is 0.9 m gray. And another welcoming feature is that with this comb beam CT, our therapist can actually visually inspect if the breast is within this beam aperture, which is concurrently displayed on the treatment console. 
So that really enables the confidence both from the therapist team and from the physician's team um, uh, in, in terms of uh, administering the type of treatment accurately on a daily basis. Another protocol we, call, we also use is called image gently for breast uh, because it enhances the contrast uh, of the uh, tumor bed, uh, particularly for APBI or a, a boost treatment. The reason is that for um, image gently, we can use the iterative reconstruction. Iterative re reconstruction, comb beam CT on Halcyon, suppresses the noise. As a, as a result of that, sort of enhances the contrast to noise ratio. So based on our experience, we think that's beneficial for tumor bed, tumor bed alignment, and that it's also a very low dose. It's around a 1 m gray CTDI. This is an example of how comb beam CT actually made our physician team more confident. Um, this is a patient had had a, a breast swelling uh, in mid-course, and we're able to catch that on the comb beam CT and take uh, measures to address that. So I want to end this uh, talk with a couple of clinical experience publications we saw sort of give you an idea of you know, overall uh, the experience after um, several, many patients have treated. The first one is, is, is written or led by uh, Dr. Barsky um, on, the, on the initial clinical experience treating breast cancer patient with six FFF beams because not many patients so far were treated as six FFF for breast cancer, especially for whole breast radiation. And in this one, we captured 30-plus uh, patients. That was some of them are breast only, some of them are with chest wall, uh, just, so chest wall only, and with axilla, without axilla, comprehensive or non-comprehensive. The um, and some of them got electron treatment, some of them got mid-intangents photon treatment. So we really captured a, a full variety of different patients. And I want to show you um, the first one is the sufficiency data. When we evaluated 600-plus sessions we were able to see that the average in-room time, that this is average deployment time. This time is when the patient leaves the gown waiting area from that time until the patient returns to the gown waiting area. So the total sort of um, time that occupies one therapist uh, uh, to treat patients is 12.4 minutes on the health sound. So, we, so with this, actually, this supports our, our decision to you know how much time we should give to these patients. Of course, when you have uh, prone treatment, when you have bilateral treatment, this time is slightly elevated. But this, the, if you look at, if you look more into this, uh, um, this will be a extra your reference if you want to decide how long you want to get to this type of treatment. And, and then also, 95% over 95% fraction did not require a re-imaging to correct for the rotation error. So we're on, we're we're doing pretty good on straightening the patient. Early toxicity data also published in this. Uh, in this uh, manuscript, and on, overall, we have very comparable early toxicity data compared to MD Anderson random trial using the same regimen, uh, a similar hypofractionated uh, uh, treatment, um, because that basically shows that even though it's a softer beam, uh, even though it's you know has better interest, higher entrance dose, our early toxicity data remains the same. The second one is a, published by one of our physics resident, uh, Feng O'Grady. Um, on the increase in superficial dose. And this study um, sort of looked at into the in vivo dose symmetry for a lot of the patients with, that we have done, and look at their in vivo dose symmetry results uh, when, we re, when they receive the, the treatment on health young. So overall, if we, when we look at OSLD measured superficial dose um, on, for those patients, we're getting roughly between 80 to 85% on average for these patients. Every patient got 12 OSLD measurements. So it's not only is one, uh, one measurement per patient, it's multiple measurements per patient. So when we, when we compare this result, this is the average measurement for all the 11 patients to the, the um, two beam 6x superficial dose. We can see that the superficial dose for breast patients getting treated on healthy on is about 10% higher, which put us into the same dose range as if you bolus every other day on the two beam. So what this graph means that for the patient that you're going to treat on healthy on, for breast patients you're treating on healthy on, you have to reevaluate your bolusing strategy. So obviously bolusing every other day for healthy on will likely to be a little bit too much for a lot of, for some of the patients. So we sort of encourage you to look at the case by case basis and reevaluate your bolusing strategy for breast patient on healthy on treatment. So to sum up, healthy on introduced several new designs, new uh, 
on both on the machine side and on the software side, they're focused on the quality, uh, focused on the efficiency, but at the same time they can maintain the same quality. With the new design, it presents a lot of uh, challenges for, especially for dosimetry and planning to how to deal with that. Fortunately, at least in this talk, we present our experience of we use e-comp and multi, uh, and then both automatic and manual to deal with uh, those type of challenges. We use multi ISO center to deal with the, the challenge uh, uh, of the field size limitation. And uh, for photon boost, we, we look at the data and we look at our patients, we show that the majority of the patient can actually be treated safely using the photon boost technique as opposed to using the electron. So I want to really take the last slide and sort of reflect what we, what the health health system uh, is about. So in, in the past 10, 20 years, the majority of the, the development in radiation oncology has been focused on increasing machine capabilities and then produce better looking plants, but very little are done at the end, at the last stage of the delivery, the very forefront of the battle where we actually administer treatment at a very single day. That's, that, that's what we believe will be, you know, the next most important target to hit. And Halcyon, through the daily low-dose combined CT um, capabilities, sort of provides us with the confidence that the treatment delivery has actually happened um, fairly accurately. And we have a way to go back and look at if it's happened accurately on, on a fractional basis. So we feel that this is a, this is the actually this is a very uh, good direction to change uh, for our uh, field. The our early clinic experience demonstrated a safe and effective treatment, efficient treatment for breast cancer on healthy young. I want to point out that uh, you you will need to reassess your bolusing strategy because of the superficial dose that we see a little bit higher uh, than the uh, typical 6x uh, beams. So here's our bibliography that we uh, produced and, and we used um, uh, for health and treatment, and uh, I highlighted some of them that's particularly um, relevant to the, the breast treatment, including the step-by-step -step process of how we do the multiple field uh, treatment and our health young, and, uh, and a lot of the data that uh, I talk about in this presentation. So with that, thank you very much, and I'll take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Lee, for a very thorough presentation. At this time, 